Let's see. I'll let you know when we're all good. All right, Steve. It looks like we're live here, buddy. Yay. Good evening, YouTube world. <laughs> nice to see everybody here. We've got some fans from Steve's side and we've got some fans from my side. Welcome. Today is going to be an episode of How to Rock Astrology. I'm very, very excited to be bringing my dear friend Steve Judd on to hang out with us today. And to talk a little bit about a few things, uh, me and Steve have already hung out a little bit, talked about some stuff that we would want to rap about. Now, uh, me and Steve were just talking. We thought maybe we'd give everybody a little intro. Sorry about that. Fun technical things. So uh, what I'd like to do is just give a little introduction to who I am. Uh, most of the people on my channel know who I am. I'm Dustin Cormier. Uh, I'm what I would like to call a tropical Vedic astrologer. I like to make the distinction between tropical as a system of measurement and Vedic as a system of interpretation. So that's why as a, really my roots are in Western astrology. I'm in Canada, right? So uh, I've been trying to invite all of the brightest minds in the Western tradition to bring them onto my channel and have a nice little mixer where I'm going to really just, you know, I, I like to talk about Western astrology with my Western viewers because much of my audience is already steeped in that as well. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, now, Steve, Steve, you've been uh, doing astrology for a long time, probably, I think you mentioned 40 plus years. Uh, I picked up my first ephemeris in 1977. 1977. Now, what I often like to do, Steve, uh, maybe I'll just I'll finish by saying that everybody who's watching this, you probably all know Steve Judd. Um, you can find Steve Judd at www.stevejudd.co. Am I correct on that? That's Steve's website. You can find him on there. And if you get a lot out of this discussion and you want to set up a consultation with him, uh, if you want to email him about anything, you can find his contact information on his website. Uh, you are one of the pioneering Western astrologers in general, let alone on YouTube, Steve. Uh, I had a lot of fun talking with you about the fact that you're, you're somebody who's been doing this for so long. Um, we're going to probably, we're going to talk about the fact that you, you own an ephemeris and you use it judiciously. It's something that I am deeply, you know, I, I love hearing that you talk about that because many people like me in the modern age of technology really lean pretty hard on our software. And we don't actually have the visceral experience of looking in the sky and thinking about where East is, where Aries is actually in the local space. I'd love to talk with you about that because it's something that I even need to work out myself. The millennial in me is just like, ah, but it is what it is. <laughs> so, so thank you, Steve. Uh, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. My now, name's Steve Judd. I'm a professional astrologer. I've been studying astrology unofficially since 1977 and properly since 1980. Um, mm. For the first year, I got all my horoscopes wrong because I didn't know about time zone changes. Uh -huh. But from 1981, I've started doing readings for people, and um, and now doing readings and writing books is is the only source of income I've got. So yeah, astrology is my life. Wow, you're really uh, doing it. Without it, I probably wouldn't be here by now. So I'm very grateful. Wonderful, astrology is the gift that keeps on giving. Now, Steve, uh, before we really kick off here. Uh, I've made a little uh, often what I like to do, and I I should ask you. Uh, you and I talked about this. That's why I'm launching it at you. Uh, you've mentioned that one of the things I love about you is that you're a very open person. All information I is there. I'm not going to sing. Oh, no. Oh, darn. That was my second question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Damn. All right. I'll save that one maybe for later. <laughs> um, what I wanted to ask you, Steve, is that you mentioned to me uh, your, your astrological positions. I often like, we don't need to share your birth time or nothing, but I often do like to discuss your big three. Uh, would you, uh, Now I've prepared a little picture here. Do you mind if I share that really quick? Fine. Alrighty, so I'm just going to share my screen. And here we have Steve Judd. Uh, this is the basic little thing I've given for our big three. We can see that you're a Virgo rising. 
You have the sun in Cancer. I've kind of put it in the general vicinity of between the tenth and sort of the ascendant. Uh, I'm. I think by Vedic reckoning, we would say that you are in the eleventh sign from the rising sign. Uh, if you don't mind my asking, would you consider that your sun has an eleventh house energy? Absolutely not. Okay, so because uh, I know that you use the, I believe you called it the por- porphyr porphyr system Free. of. What is it? Porphyry house system, yeah. Porphyry house system. All right. So, uh, if if you don't mind my asking, where would what house energy would you align with your son then? Just for the record, I'm quite open about this. I was born on the third of July, 1955, at 11:45 a.m. local time in a town called Eastley, all one word, which is halfway between Southampton and Winchester in the south of England. Cool. And that indeed makes me cancer with Virgo rising Sagittarius moon with the moon on the IC and the sun in the 10th house of Korea. Gotcha. So that's, that makes sense to me. That's a wonderful place for the sun to be uh, in Vedic reckoning. It's actually, there's a, there's a powerful thing going on here. When the moon is closer to the fourth house, it, it gains strength in Vedic astrology. It's called dig Bala. It's because the moon is at the bottom of the chart listening to the instincts within the foundation of the heart. And that's what the moon as a receptive planet really should be doing as well as the sun does well when it is being pushed to exalt its karma and the world stage that that's a good place for the sun to be as well. So uh, it's very nice to see your energy here. Uh, I'd like to note for my audience that they know that I often mention the Chinese astrology. Uh, You're in the sign of the wood goat. And one of the things I wanted to mention is very cool that you are a, the, the year of the goat or the sheep. Uh, I'm also the year of the goat. I'm born 1991. Uh, and we both share Sagittarius moon within very close degrees. Mine's at 18. And I believe you mentioned that yours is about 21. 21 Sag moon. Yeah. Wonderful. So for everybody watching, that's kind of a fun thing to just be able to just mention here. So. <clears throat> That's a little bit about our energies. Um, everybody who knows me, uh, I'm a Leo rising with Scor- uh, the sun in Scorpio and the moon also in Sagittarius. So, Steve, <clears throat> uh, again, I'm, I'm just so very thankful. You know, somebody like me, I've been revving up my YouTube game as much as I can for all this time. You have really taken quite a stride in getting to the world of YouTube. I really appreciate somebody like you reaching your hand out to somebody like me and coming into your audience and meeting everybody who you've been uh, connecting to through this career on on the internet. I really appreciate you giving me your time today, man. So now, Steve, uh, I've written down a few things that you and I could rap about. And really, we're pretty open-ended here. It's 11 o'clock where I am. I'm aiming to, for this to be an hour, maybe a bit above an hour. I mean, I, I don't mind going for as long as you, as you are down for. I think we mentioned aiming for about an hour and 15 minutes. And then we're going to call her, right? Very good. So, Steve, I believe one of the things that you and I wanted to talk about before we really get ripping, I believe that you mentioned that you might want to talk about the state of a str- Oh, before, before we do that, let's talk about our ch- the chart at present. Are you interested in sharing that? Okay, Steve. Yeah. Thank you very much. That You mentioned that this is something you like to do, and I think it's a great idea. So I'm going to go here, do, 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 and this is the chart of the present moment. Now, can you see what I'm looking at here, Steve? I certainly can. Do you want Alrighty. to give your spin on it, and then I'll give my take on it? All righty. Uh, well, uh, it's interesting for me because uh, th- to really just take – a transit glimpse at what's happening at this immediate moment uh, is something that's interesting to me. I'm usually thinking about a natal chart. So this is the chart of 11 a.m. So I'm considering that we're probably in cancer rising now by this moment. Uh, It seems to me that it's a wonderful thing that all of the planets are on top of the chart at this present moment. I think that this might give us a wonderful sense that all of our energies is being put towards a public display. 
uh, thinking really about what's going on in the world, what is going on in the stage at large. Uh, the moon in Jupiter and Neptune being in the ninth house of the rising sign is giving me uh, a feeling that there's a real, well, I should say the ninth, hmm. it's the ninth sign from the rising sign, which is Pisces. But of course the M, thank you, Steve. I'm, I love the way you think about this because I can see that all these plants are actually close to the MC. So this, the moon, Jupiter and Neptune being close to the MC gives us a little bit of a, a charge in uh, the sense of where our personalities are moving uh, where Jupiter is moving, which is really the fundamental consciousness, is being perpetuated through the MC. Jupiter is a very important planet in Vedic astrology. And for Jupiter to be with the moon really shows, at least I feel this right now, that there is a, a homey sense of being willing to launch off into Jupiter things. Uh, and it's being aimed at career and you know, really the 10th house for us and the 10th house for everybody at this present moment. The reason I'm saying that is because the moon, our personality, what makes us comfortable is sitting there with Jupiter with the MC. It's interesting that Neptune is here. Uh, Neptune is visiting us and possibly making this have what could be philosophical, spiritual, metaphysical, uh, even psychedelic, psychological leanings. Uh, Jupiter being with Neptune, I think has been launching everybody because Jupiter being in the sign of Neptune has been going on for a long time. This is a longstanding trend that's been sort of launching everybody into uh, a need to philosophically explore all things Neptunian. As well, this would also say that Neptune is adding its mysterious illusion and disillusionment to all things Jupiter. Uh, this is really the main focus in my brain. I mean, the sun being exalted in Aries is, it's, is a very th special thing as well. Uh, the last thing that I'm really, my brain is wanting to say is that in Vedic astrology, we consider Jupiter being in Pisces to be in what is anciently known as its sign ruler. Uh, Vedic people consider that Neptune is a sub- lord uh well really the, the vedic people don't really consider too much of the outer planets which is something i'm trying to change but jupiter is considered the main stay of pisces and by being in its own sign jupiter is in a good place for philosophical speculation and cross-cultural boundary appreciation shall we, shall we say that's usually how pisces works a receptiveness to what jupiter is really trying to do that's probably me throwing paint at the wall in the best that I could, Steve. Okay, I'll have a go. Um, the moon, that, that horoscope is a, blueprint, is, a, is a blueprint of a moment in time. We started this broadcast on that moment of time. So that horoscope is a blueprint for what we're doing now. With the moon conjunct Jupiter, there's the desire to expand and grow in terms of knowledge dissemination to get mm. people to not only learn, but to feel as well, especially with the moon conjunct Neptune as well, because that brings in the capacity for not only empathy and compassion, but also intuition. Mm. So the whole moon Jupiter Neptune thing in Pisces in the 10th house is about um, expanding and growing one's sensitivity and sensuality, especially at this time now. Mm. However, we do have that Mars-Saturn conjunction mm. in Aquarius, which is going to be exact in about three or four days' time. Mm. And I also note that in two and a half days' time, it will be the new moon where the sun and the moon and Mercury and Chiron will all be pretty much exactly conjunct each other at the same time as Mars is conjunct Saturn. And that suggests to me that the developments of the coming three days are in many ways a kind of, if you like, a, a kind of tipping point or, or the tip of the iceberg in a way that's going to bring both um, resolution and, and changes in global situations at this time. I hope for the better. Mm, mm -hmm. I hope. Although I do expect things to get worse in the very short term with that Mars-Saturn. Mm. 
Um, you know, I think that the sun, the Mars and Saturn occurring in Aquarius, uh, in Vedic reckoning, Aquarius again has a primary rulership of Saturn. Uh, yes, in the old in the old style before the discovery of Uranus, Saturn ruled Aquarius as Jupiter ruled Pisces, mm. and Mars is great in Aquarius. No, yes, I do agree with that, but I am inclined to think that Saturn is the one who's in its own home here. Uh, yeah, but. Uh, if, it, if we're going to have a Mars-Saturn conjunction, I'd rather have it in Aquarius than most other signs. No kidding. Cool. Because that's really an even plane for both of them, because I know that Mars can do well in Aquarius. Mm, mm. So I, I think it's a lovely chart, to be honest. Uh, I don't want to get too hopeful or optimistic, but, mm -hmm. you know, we somehow, by pure pure luck, although such a thing doesn't really exist, mm -hmm. by synchronicity, mm -hmm. we managed to elect a time to do this at a very fortuitous time. Wonderful. I'm glad. I'm I'm glad that this worked out that way. It would have sucked if we brought all this all up. It was like, yeah, we, we should be doing this right moon, now. Dustin. I wouldn't have done it on a void moon or, or a I, difficult full moon or something like that. I know that you're like that, Steve. You have got your eye on the prize and the ephemeris all the time. That's, That's something it. I'd so, love to so wrap about. Let me ramble about this for a minute. Give me one minute on this. Absolutely. I'll tell your audience this. That this it's, it's a tatty version. It's my personal one. This is a, an ephemeris. Mm. Okay. It's a position. It's a, it's a day to day pattern. It's, it's like a bus timetable or a train timetable. It gives you the positions for every planet in the sky for every day of the year for 50 years, or you can get a hundred year ones as well. And it goes and by so if you stare at it long enough, you can see all the numbers gradually moving forward at different speeds. And from that, you can form patterns in your mind. And that gives you the idea of pattern recognition, which is that from my perspective, actually what astrology is. It is the translating of uh, patterns in the heavens into ground-based phenomena, both personally and collectively. And then utilizing that in terms of either learning how to cope with challenges or using it as windows of opportunity to improve the quality of both your life and the life of your friends, clients, family, and the world around you. And okay. seeing the patterns happening is something that, you know, the trajectory factor is something oh. that you've really taught me. It's not. It's not just like for now. I mean, we can sp using using software. You can, looking at the chart we're looking at now. Mm -hmm. You can speed it up so right. that you can see the chart moving sixty times faster or a thousand times faster, and you can see the patterns unfolding and mm -hmm. stop it at any time to translate that pattern into words. But it's not only about the minute by minute or the even the day by day or or, or even longer. Mm -hmm. There's a way you can do it. With the, now that we've got the technological revolution that we've got in the last 30 years, I can look back three, five, ten thousand years. And you just looking at the very slow moving planets, the outer planets, uh, and, and, and look at the patterns they formed at critical junctures of human history. And from extrapolating what those patterns meant at that time in history, you can then project it forward. Mm. And I'm particularly all my life, all my astrological life, I've been waiting for 2025 and 2026. Cool. Because within the space of a year, Pluto will move from feminine Capricorn into masculine Aquarius. Uranus will move from feminine Taurus into masculine uh, Gemini. And both Saturn and Neptune together will move from feminine Pisces into masculine Aries. And there is a Saturn-Neptune conjunction in February 26 at the zero degrees of Aries. That's going to be a and, good and a bad thing because Saturn's the oh, This can be a very Aries. big, it can be a very bad thing. It can be a very good thing. Right. But to right. me, this is, if I hate to use this metaphor because it's so cliche, but to me, this is the start of the age of Aquarius. Mm, I see. I see why you're saying that. And I see why you're why you're saying that this could be a thing. You know, I mean, because we got to go through Saturn and Aries and it just happens to be that we're going through Saturn and Aries with a loaded deck with Pluto being trying your honest like that. Holy Lord. <clears throat> yeah, but at that time, um, Neptune and Saturn together will be both sextiling Uranus and sextiling Pluto and Uranus will be trying Pluto 
the long-term implications of this time are excellent. Whether mm. the, the corporations, the governments, the power brokers will, will voluntarily work with this energy, even if they don't recognize it, mm. or not remains to be seen. Right. But it's certainly pointing to collectively across the world a really big surge a in individual self determination. Mm, I see that the paint is going to be wet at that time. And it's going to be an important issue is going to be who's holding the paintbrush in terms of what kind of reality is going to be created going forward. Well, as I'm fond of saying, we, it's this one planet, but seven billion different worlds. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all responsible for our own perception and we can choose to see it as doom and gloom or we can choose to see it as windows of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had my fair share of doom and gloom. And as I get toward, towards not the end of my life, but as I get into my later years, I'm, I reckon I'm about 80 percent of the way through my life. So I choose to I choose to see things in a positive way because it's good for my soul. I've, I just read that as pure Saturn, you know, uh, in the Vedic idea, we go through phases of life, um, life periods. And once a person gets to about like 66, you know, like around where you're playing, they take on a Saturn energy and Saturn's very, very matter of fact about matters of, oh, death I, love of that bugger. I think he's great. He's, <laughs> did you say, I love that bugger. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's all right. He's okay. Yes. You know, a lot of people don't like him, but to me, he's, Grounded, down to earth, pragmatic, realistic, and he, and he, and he's got a simple principle that says if you do everything the hard way, it guarantees you success. Wonderful, yeah, totally, and that's a beautiful thing, you know, seeing that from somebody who has the experience of life that you do, and the experience of life plus from an astrologer's perspective, it's very refreshing to young people and to the young generation. You know, I often I love inviting astrologers like you on here because there's a generational conversation happening as well as everything else going on. Where I do have a problem is with the younger astrologers of today, and I exclude you from this. Sweet. <laughs> particularly in Britain, there's a, there's a larger number of younger astrologers out there today who are, for some strange reason that I've not been able to fathom, taking a big retro step, retrograde step back 40 years and going back into traditional astrology and disregarding the influences of Chiron, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Right, yeah. Just, just working with the planets out to Saturn. That's a traditionalist viewpoint. And yes, you can get results that way, but it seems naturally too limiting, too restrictive. And well, I, I failed to understand that. Totally. You know, Steve, I'm going to tell you, as a young person who is grappling with the conversation between traditional and the emerging modernity, I'm going to give you a quick little gumball of where I'm, I'm really kind of on the middle of a plane here. So as a Vedic person, I have been studying the traditional mindset of astrology that the Vedic people this is a time when there were no telescopes in these sorts of things. Uh, so they were looking at local space and what they saw was the Sapta Grahas. That's mm. the seven Grahas. They didn't have the technology for telescopes to see what is beyond Saturn. So they developed a whole consciousness out of this. There are some people that say that there is Indian literature that actually refers to the outer planets, but people couldn't make the correlation because they didn't have telescopes. The ancient sages that talked about astrology very well could have talked about those outer planets, but there was no laymen to write their findings on what was being said. The, you know, the ancient sages had the clairvoyance to know that Saturn is what Saturn is. The lay people would observe Saturn and say, yes, that's correct. This is what's happening. The sage is saying that when Saturn is in Aries, all this is going to happen. We can correlate it. There was no telescopes that could correlate the outer planets. And so it got lost in the metaphors of what some people are saying are Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Brahma is the grandfather Uranus. Vishnu is the preserver of the universe, Neptune. And then Shiva is the destroyer, Pluto. And yeah. so the literature is there, but the astronomical correlation isn't necessarily there. So what I often think about is this, Steve. The Vedic people are very serious about connecting the Saptagrahas, the first seven planets, to the chakras and the chakras of yoga. So this is my understanding of it, is that 
I think any planet that is going to grow human consciousness is, you know, there's trillions and trillions of galaxies out there and all of them could have life, but the only ones that are going to have human life are going to be the ones that abide by the ancient schema of astrology. There's going to be a sun. There's going to be a moon on the, on the earth. There's going to be a Mars that correlates with Aries and Scorpio. There's going to be a Venus that correlates with Libra and Taurus. There's going to be a Mercury that correlates with Gemini and Virgo. Gemini and Virgo, all these signs are tropical phenomena. It's a miracle that we have planets that reflect the Zodiac. But then again, what else would there be but conscious beings? You know, if there was no beings with consciousness who could perceive time going by moment to moment, then time is just going to sift through a brrr, um, uh, an infinite what, cosmic... What comes first, the chicken or the egg? Bingo, right? So we have to observe it in order for it to be. Now, my estimation is that the first seven planets co do correlate with the chakras. This is my own kind of idea here. And yeah, so right. any, any, right? any galaxy that grows human consciousness is going to have a sun, a moon, a Mars, a, a Mercury, a Venus, a Jupiter, and a Saturn. But the outer planets, in my estimation, are not part of the chakras. The, they do not correlate with the chakras. What they are is the particular background of collective karma for this particular galaxy. If we find another planet with humans, they'll have the seven planets, but they might have different outer planets. Is there not a case for saying that the seven, seven chakras, as we know it, relate purely to the physical body and that in the more multidimensional form of existence, there are more chakras that are not visible or physically manifest? Nailed it. Nailed it. And wherever they are in the signs is going to correlate to the karma of those chakras for those people born at that time. Now, now this is a discussion you and I have already had, but I'm going to repeat it for the benefit of the listeners. Yes, please. With the Vedic, there comes this notion of this word karma. Yeah, yeah. Now, for many people, astrologically speaking, karma is associated with a point in the horoscope called the North Node, which was brought into Western astrology in the 1890s by Helena P. Blavatsky of the okay. Theosophical Society. And she brought with it the... I wouldn't know whether to say the Hindu or the Vedic, or probably the both, translation of karma as being, okay, if you do good in this life, you get a better life next time, or the sins you suffer in this life is because you had a bad life last time. It, I struggled with 30 years for 30 years with this until I reached a point where I thought, I'm too busy living this life in a Western world to worry about past lives or future lives. I've got plenty of dreams of being a monk ambling through the forest, drinking mead or a guard in a concentration camp. Right. Uh, but to me, it's just like homeopathic droplets of this life or that life. So instead of dealing with linear reincarnation, I've chosen to see the North Node as instead of karma, I see it as mission statement, purpose, and reason why you volunteered to come to planet Earth in the first place. Right. And if that principle of volunteering to come here is taken on board, then alongside and parallel with it is the realization that death as we understand it does not exist. It is just a transition of consciousness from one dimension of reality to another. Okay. I, I love the way you put, and I remember us talking about it, Steve. So I have, I have something I'd like to get you to think about, because I think you and I are ultimately going to land in the same space here. It's the classic philosophical thing of, is it reincarnation or because, you know, the yogis understand that karma is a continuing perpetuation that doesn't make them pay any less attention to the present moment. There's a wonderful Zen story where there's a piece of wood, and there's a, the, the, once you burn the piece of wood, it's on fire. And now it's fire. It's no longer wood. Once that burnt piece of wood has become ash, it's no longer fire. It is ash. There is no continuity of progression there. Once something is ash, that's what it is. Classic Zen sort of thought. What I'd like you to consider is, this is the thing I always play with people in terms of reincarnation and free will. Because you've mentioned that the North Node is something that we volunteer to choose. Now, when I get up in the morning, Steve, I get up and I make some porridge. Now, why do I, I, I volunteer, 
I use my will and I choose to make porridge. That's my, it's my free will, right? Is mm. it my free will though? Or is it because my digestive system is empty and needs fuel? The actions previous to that chosen volunteered free will have caused me to volunteer to make the action. When we, when we looked at the joint chart, we, we commented on how ev- on, the, on the chart at the moment, we commented how everything is in the top half, mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. public domain, the daylight hours. And if it was in the bottom half, it would be much more in the dark hours, the extrovert. Mm-hmm. Using Western astrology, the same principle applies to the left-hand side and the right, in that the left-hand side, people with everything on the left-hand side are much more in principle in, with words like uh, free will, choice, and self-determination, whereas people with everything on the right-hand side are more in, pr- in tune with words like fate, destiny, and predetermination. Um, you can, uh, to an extent, I'm digging myself into a corner here because I'm saying the chart dictates behavior, but I have everything on the left. So to me, free will is everything. I will wake up in the morning and my digestion will say, I'm hungry, I need food, but I can choose whether I have fruit, porridge, cheese on toast, eggs. So we have choice, but at the end of the day, we're here for a purpose and we're going to do that whether it's willingly or kicking and screaming. Wonderful. Yep. I agree with that. And I think that, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. What is the prompt for each individual to choose why they incarnated here? But I think if I'm reading you correctly, that heart of choice is something that's more eternal and kind of cannot get gripped by what we call karma. Karma is this incidental thing that happens from all the actions that come from us. But ultimately there is an eternal heart that is perpetuated in this lifetime now. And in two hours from now, there's going to be many different choices, but it's the same heart with the same mission that happened to incarnate on this planet to do its thing. And I'm absolutely convinced that about 2000 years ago, it was the Buddha that first come up with the face. Yes, it happens. (laughs) <laughs> yeah no kidding eh? <laughs> that's hilarious dude so, yeah <laughs> but, interesting you know, character you, 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 you can you've always got to have you've got to always factor in wriggle room mm. there is no way that you can say that something is going to happen at a set time in a set place there's always mm. got to be the option to to have an element of free will alongside the intent not the intention but to hold intent within you to create something magical, something new, something innovative. Hmm. That totally makes sense to me. You know, it's interesting as I'm getting into deeper into yoga, uh, what I'm coming to find is that the Indian, the Indian tradition is much more steeped in astrology than most yoga people realize. And one of the highest ends of yoga, it begins to, you, you do a meditation practice where you let go of the compulsion of your subliminal and subconscious and your unconscious there's a compulsive nature there when you begin to draw it in you go through the layers of the compulsion that they call the chakras and eventually you end at a place where you try to attain samadhi and samadhi is an applied practice of pure awareness when you tap into pure awareness you're just being what you are what that eternal heart is that we've been talking about And it's very true that, you know, some people might have the will to say, I think I'm going to eat a steak this morning, or I'm going to go to McDonald's this morning. And that is your true, that's the will of that moment. But when you start applying the yoga of pure awareness, you're eventually going to start to think from a place of understanding that your nature and your divinity is something that is inherent, has always been there, and is kind of eternal in a way. Do you think that this nature of the heart, or if we were to describe anything to the heart, is something that's eternal, or do you think that the spider web of of events that we see in astrology is that heart? I wonder if I'm making myself clear here. Unlike any other species that's ever existed on planet Earth, Humans have the ability to laugh at themselves. Mm. They have the ability to recognize themselves in mirrors and they have self-reflective consciousness. I don't do heroes, but if I did, one of my heroes would be Terence McKenna, 
And he, he said that human history represents such a radical shift in, in terms of the systems of biological organization that preceded it, but it must be something fundamentally different. And he philosophized that humanity is, is acting towards some type of, he called it a dwell point, I call it a magnet in the future that's pulling us forward in terms of evolution mm -hmm. in a way that no other species on this planet has ever known. If that Novelty. is the case, and I believe it to be so, that also gives us the free will to occasionally, sometimes deliberately, screw up. Mm -hmm. And I like the uh, I like having the free will to sometimes say, no, I think I will shoot myself in the foot. I know I'll pay for it, but mm -hmm. the lesson I'll learn long time is good. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes I just want to go out and have a few beers or go and shout at a football match, knowing that it's perhaps not what my karma should be telling me to do, and I'm not going to achieve any particular enlightenment, but I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's if you're enjoying it, it's part of the bliss that you're seeking. It's just simply the fact is, is that there are many paths to the bliss that you're seeking, and some are better than others. Whenever uh, so I see someone getting a little bit too pious or holier than that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Certainly, certainly, Steve. You're, I just want to make a custard pie, you know. <laughs> yeah, I love that, you know, because the only way you're going to figure out what's good for you is by doing what you feel. Yeah. Uh, I like to, one of my favorite metaphors is Krishna's flute. Krishna's flute is all the bliss, is when you feel bliss, you are going to keep moving yourself through whatever your will pushes you towards. And some of it's going to feel ultimately good and some of it's not. The stuff that's good for you, only you are going to know through the bliss that you experience in your own experience. That's what they call Krishna's flute. It's this mystical knowing of what you're supposed to be doing. And the only way to do that is by, in my opinion, undo the shackles, drink the beer, see how you feel, <laughs> spill the wine, dig that girl. <laughs> you know, that's the only way you're going to experience. Out you're yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful, Steve. Now, you know what I want to do, Steve? Uh, this is one of the first times where I've done a live stream like this. Uh, I think there's a million things we could talk about and we're going to. Would you like to take just a moment to take a quick eyeball at the comments that our audience has been giving to I'd, us? I'd love that. I can't see them, but you'll have to forward yep. them to me. But yeah, no, I'd no problem. Be delighted. So it, uh, for better or worse, I'm looking at quite the list here. So I'm just going to see if I can get any specific things. Knowing my, knowing my students, as I do, I suspect that one or two of them are lurking in the background and they're probably going to throw one or two curveballs in here. So good. We've got uh, one person who's asked our opinions on Vedic versus Western. And I think that we've done that in pretty good. Uh, let's uh, we've got some folks saying smash that like button. That's very nice. Uh We've got people born in the UK, just like you are, Steve. Steve's channel, loving this. Mars transits your natal Mars is really powerful. Got some people saying that my therapist thinks I'm crazy. He joined the club. <laughs> uh, let's see. What think a while? Mm -hmm. Yep. Cosmic Rose. Do you think because of all those masculine signs that demasculating of men will stop? We've got a, so somebody is saying, uh, this is somebody named Brown Eyed, Brown Eye Lady. Steve, this is probably referring to, well, both of us, but you were talking about how around 2025, there's going to be a lot of masculine energy happening. Pluto is going to be coming into Aquarius. Uranus is going to be in Gemini. And Neptune, I believe, is going to be in Aries with Saturn. And Brown Eye Lady is asking, do you think because of all those masculine signs, that the demasculating of men will stop. Let's not confuse the idea of feminine and masculine signs in astrology as pertaining particularly to specific gender traits in humans. Mm. Mm. I'm, I have a major problem with the patriarchal attitude of a large proportion of men on this planet and the Neanderthal attitudes of many men. I exclude from this the men who study, 90% of the men who study astrology. Mm. There's, there's one or two barbaric astrologers out there, but not many, fortunately. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would love to see a situation where, uh, and I can see a situation in the future, where gender balance in terms of 
corporate management, political committees, um, military groupings is 50-50 all down the way. I've, I've experienced situations where women have a majority and they can be just as cruel and savage as men, although in different ways. Mm, people are people. People are people. But if we had a much more proportionate balance of masculine and feminine energy across the board, I do believe that ultimately this would be a wonderful example to our children and grandchildren, and thus the world would evolve into a much more balanced place. Mm. And I think it's an important, it's a, it's a hot topic these days. I'd like to just ask you, just to continue in a way, because Brown Eyed, Brown Eyed Lady, our questioner, has kind of underlined uh, a, uh, a, an understanding with this question, which is that this masculinity imbalance is happening i've been thinking i don't know if whether it's an imbalance but there's i think it's possible that since uranus has been in aries there's yeah. been a bit of a check on what masculinity exactly means now yeah. it's gone into taurus now which is the reception of what masculinity and gender is i think Ma aries and taurus in some ways are the most susceptible to explorations of gender when any planet visits them because aries is the first sign it's about as masculine as it gets taurus is in some ways also about as feminine as it gets i guess maybe libra would be closer to that mark but aries and libra are reflections of each other so what do you think about what i'm kind of nosing around with there firstly the whole for for, for 2,000, 3,000 years, any non-conventional, any non-heterosexual activity has been at least frowned on, if not actively censored and repressed. Just in the last 30, 40 years, we've had a release of these old structures. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we're now in the middle of a tidal wave of LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, just in recent years, just since Neptune's moved into Pisces, mm -hmm. the whole transgender thing right. and the whole uh, different polarity in sexual identity. Nice. Nailed now, this is, this is a hotbed and anything that any one of us says can be taken the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful what you say in this context, because there's always going to be trolls out there who will jump on you from a great height. Mm -hmm. uh, anonymously no doubt mm -hmm. uh, it is a fact that when a baby is born they are born as one gender or another the way they then choose to represent their life and the changes they choose to make in their life as they age mm -hmm. is a matter of free will right they say that the biological gender tends to be factual but ultimately incidental is kind of what that's a fair way to put it yes mm -hmm. Yes, especially in the changing times of today. But viewed over history, when you see something that's been suppressed a long time and then it's released, we could we could step out the gender issue and, and look at the sort of suppression of communi the communist repression where, and the sudden release of that when the Berlin Wall came down and the liberation of, of a lot of old communist states as another metaphor for this. Mm -hmm. After a time, the tidal wave of change will balance out. Mm -hmm. This I agree with. That will happen in my lifetime or not, I don't know. But in, in a period of time, within 100 years, it would have balanced out and would have a much more stable and consistent balanced attitude towards gender identity, regardless mm. of how many different genders there will be recognized at that time. Wonderful. I do agree with that, Steve. And I think that ultimately, you know, as you and I are both very open minded people, and I would even. I, I would pull you into the idea of, of being a scientific minded person. And uh, <laughs> should I be careful with that one? <laughs> um, my favorite example is from Linus in Peanuts, who says when, when there's a cartoon about the vaccine, when they said everyone's saying trust the science. And, and actually, the idea of asking questions about the science is science, because if you can't question it, it's not science. Right. You've this got to be able to question it. Gotcha, Steve. And I think you're see, I think you're going to understand what, what I'm getting at here, which is that, you know, I don't think it's a safe place really to make any statement of how this gender thing ought to come through because we're in the phase of transformation. Let the experiment go. Much, through. Very much so. And um, my my idea is 
that in a time like this, we should all just be as open as we possible to whatever information people are trying to work this through. Because there are lots of people- loving are, And loving. And loving. That's right. And, 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 you know, we've got to come from that place because let the experiment happen. The worst thing that could happen is that somebody explores and experiments and comes through the end, finding out that whatever they explored wasn't exactly what they were looking for. And that's- again spill the wine dig that girl you know like get get where your heart thinks it wants so you can know what it actually wants that's kind of where i'm at on the subject yeah i love your quotes from eric burden and <laughs> i'm a 60s cat man i always will be so remember the original uh, interesting that we have somebody here uh is asking about decans from the perspective of western versus vedic do you do a lot of decan stuff? No. You don't? Very no, the reason, the reason I don't is because it's so easy as an astrological student or an astrological explorer to get into decans, minor asteroids, Arabic parts. But as an astrological practitioner, someone who's actively doing astrological readings like day in day out mm. i don't have the time to get into the fine tuning mm. and what i find in my clients is that unless you're an active student who's researching your own chart as opposed to anyone else's that the, the clients i deal with they don't have time for the very subtle fine tuning the subtle nuances of things like decans or, or arabic parts until mm. they know their own chart intimately Mm, but mm. The most people, they just want the nuts and bolts, as in what's my ascendant, where's Mars in my chart, and what's that opposition from Saturn to Venus mm. all about? Mm. And really just, you know, the planets in their interactions is enough functional data for you mm. to be getting information that you need. I think that for anybody yeah, who's interested keep, in- Keep it simple, you know. Yeah, because I think anyone who's interested in exploring decans, you know, let's say the sun is just past this conjunction with Jupiter and it happened around the 20 degree mark, I believe, when, when the sun was with Neptune and Jupiter. You and I could talk to a client about what that means in their personal chart for the yeah. sign of Pisces or what it means for their sun. If that, because per- there is enough functional data there that we could give them. They, if they're interested in seeing what that means in terms of the decan of Pisces, they can research that themselves and find out some interesting little details about what was ultimately an objective experience and that the astrologer. This, this flashes back to something we started, we said at the very start of this. It, to me, it's fascinating how astrology has really had its foot rammed on the accelerator just in the last 25 years, coincidental with the development of the internet. Astrology and the internet were absolutely made for each other. Mm, yeah i'll agree with that for sure mm. and there's all the information you could possibly want out there there's a lot of different opinions as well so you have to distill it to make your own mind up mm, mm, the beauty the- of astrology is it is not a science but neither is it an art mm. it is a, a a standalone system of of both um self-understanding and the ability to um make informed choices as to the best course of action for oneself. Mm, wonderful. You know, they, in Egyptian times, I think that astrology was hailed as one of the only things that was in this regard of being one of the royal practices because it combines both science and the art of interpretation. The, the hypocrisy of the ruling elite, uh, and I'm not even going to get going on old men in skirts who run the religions because otherwise I will combust. But... Um, <laughs> You know, the British royal family, many American presidents, many global presidents and char- and rulers all around the world uh, for millennia have had astrologers at their beck and call. They just will not admit it for fear of ridicule. And this is still the case today. Oh, I see the irony that you're saying there is that, you know, probably the priests of the Vatican of the med- medieval ages in the 1600s were probably in cahoots with solar astrology and with like Absolutely. reading their horoscope to know what's going to go this on is factual. we know this to be true and then on the left hand the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing the right the left hand is going and killing people for thinking about astrology and all these Absolutely. things right right no kidding that's classic history if there ever was one 
So, Steve, I have, large, I have a large collection of stories of astrologers who have been tortured to death, burnt at the stake, have have, their, have been burnt using their astrological books as the fuel for the fire, having had their tongues nailed to the top of their mouths so that they can't talk. Hmm. Astrologers have had very gory deaths hmm. over the millennia. Totally, yeah. Uh, Christianity has its uh, blemishes. Uh, well, every, every any religion that seeks to impose belief. Mm. It's it in itself naturally flawed, in, and that no, in, in the old days, three hundred years ago, even even one hundred and fifty years ago, the idea of a priest acting as a conduit between us and the divine was perhaps acceptable because we were too busy working in the fields. Right. But right. now, but now, but now we have all the information and the knowledge we wish to acquire at our fingertips, mm. especially online, so we can build our own relationship with the divine. So the role, the role of the priest as intermediary between us and the heavens is perhaps being superseded, not only by astrologers, but by everyone as an individual. Mm -hmm. Certainly an outdated, you know, what's funny is that I find it interesting. I should like to make this point because I consider myself as a cross cultural analyzer. I say this as somebody who loves the Vedic tradition. I'm deeply steeped in the Vedic tradition, but it's important for everybody to be objective about their own etymology, their own roots of consciousness. Because I think it's interesting that in the Western tradition, there was a lot of cutting out astrology. Don't think about it. Don't talk about it. Don't look at it. Don't touch it. Get away from it. In Indian culture, it was ironically the opposite happened, where they said, you have to practice astrology through this specific gauntlet. And if you practice it any other way, you're screwing with national politics. Like they've got their calendars locked in to astrological phenomenon, which as my audience knows, there's a, there's a big debate in the Vedic astrology world between what we'd call sidereal astrology and tropical astrology. Uh, this, I'm a tropical astrologer who uses Vedic interpretation. So, you know, the whole, the sidereal means that a lot of Vedic people, they turn the signs back 23 degrees, right. And all the things are turned back 23 degrees. And I, I know Steve's just like my Lord, because it's a, it's a whole thing. What we could, we could go into it and my audience has seen enough of it, but I, I, I think I'm just making the point here. You can positively apply dogma to, a practice like astrology, just like you can negatively negate in a do dogmatic way. <clears throat> Openness is always the key, you know? That's all what I always kind of like to think of. Pause for a second, Dustin. Of course. I have to go in about 20, 25 minutes, no more. Okay. So why don't we bring in a couple more questions if there are any? Okay. So that sounds great to me, Steve. Now I'm going to do a quick peek to see, it looks to me like we've got, most people are just kind of hanging out and talking about generally the things that we're talking about. So uh, what do you think about me? Um, I think most of the folks that I've seen, I'm not seeing any questions standing out. Right. Uh, would you just, would you like to shoot the shit and just talk about some different things that I had planned for my questionnaire for you? Uh, I've got a if, you, if you're into that, Steve, because I, I, I wrote down like enough questions that we wouldn't have enough time to go through. them, And that's kind of what I figured we would go with. Right. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you is. <clears throat> so I often do these interviews and I'm trying to bring to my audience uh, you. So you're a, you're you are a practicing professional astrologer. This is what you do to get your money that pays for your house, that pays for your food. This is your professional practice. Absolutely. Now, uh, many of these interviews that I like to do, especially for this particular Astro interview series, I'm wanting to show our astrologically minded people to br open the door to them to realize that the world of being a professional astrologer is something that you should practice to take whatever schooling you need to do, discipline yourself. Um, I had a lady named Jessica Lanyado uh, talk with me. She's in LA, very, very Capricorn lady. She's brilliant. And uh, what we, sh what she mentioned is that there's no schools for astrology. 
So what she did when she first started uh, is that she put herself through her own seven year Saturn period of apprenticeship where she said for seven years when she started, like, you know, she studied for a long time. And then she said, okay, I'm going to launch myself out there as an astrologer. And she knew that everyone's like, okay, what are your credentials? And she's like, you know, so what she did to kind of prepare people for what she's doing is that she would give the caveat. I'm just, I'm still considering myself as an apprentice in this field. If you would like to join me, because she was one of the only astrologers around at the time. If you would like to be a part of this with me, this is I'm growing in this practice and I'm going to give you the information that I can and let's grow together on it, at least for the first seven years. After the seven years, it's like a Saturn quadration. If you're, if you're reading me there, uh, you know, how Saturn takes about seven years to go through a quarter of the chart. They say that it takes the body about seven years to go through all of its mm. molecules before you're a completely new body. So Saturn really hammers things in. So after about seven years, she started saying, okay, I've done enough. Now I don't need to, you know, do that. So one of the first questions I'd like to ask you, Steve, if when you jumped into the world of astrology, did you consider that you should have some sort of clinical grasp of psychological counseling before you approached people to be clients of yours? Absolutely not. Very good, because people, I suppose, aren't necessarily coming to an astrologer for but, a counseling. Bear in mind, this was in the late 70s, early 80s, and, and there was no psycho psychologists out there at that time, not, 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 not able to talk to a young hippie like me about <laughs> what I was doing. No um, also, if anyone were to come to me and said, I want to train with you to be an astrologer. I would say to them, don't be bloody stupid. <laughs> um, it, nine, 99 out of 100 people who want to be an astrologer, I would say don't. Um, because, okay, okay, look, I've got, I've got somewhere around two, 300 active students in this last year, year and a half that I'm, that I consider to be students of astrology, and I'm slowly distilling them mm. down to I've got there's about 10 now who I think are who have got the interest and the willingness to actually practice instead of just learn. Mm. Because if you're going to practice, if you're going to learn, that's great because then you can have a normal job and a normal life and 2.2 kids and a mortgage and a car and a job and you can have everything you want and it will just be a hobby. And great because you'll be able to help a few people. You'll be able to get a bit of wisdom yourself and there's nothing negative at all. If you choose to practice astrology, it will take over your life. Mm. It, she, she, not it, she mm. will consume you. She will look after you. She will also slowly and gradually over many, many years or decades, make you more and more aware of the true origins of words like alchemy and magic. Wonderful. And she will empower you in a way that you wouldn't have thought possible, but it will hurt. It has to, and it will take a long, long time and it will make you self empowered. It will, it will be, you'll become power filled instead of powerful. Mm. And you'll learn the difference between the subtleties of power and it's an amazing thing, but I wouldn't recommend most people to do it because it's a lifetime of work and dedication. Mm. You, you, there's no shortcuts. You have to do it the hard way, yeah. and it has to be done slowly. Mm -hmm. This so is totally, Steve. This makes sense to me because there's, you know, there's a sticky conversation going on in the general astrology community, which is it's sort of the same thing that's going on with yoga. Anyone could come along and say, hey, I've done 200 hours as a yoga teacher. But when you get there, all they're doing is Pilates, you know, but they say that they've got the credentials for the thing. In the same way, in the astrology world, we got plenty of people who are really excited to talk about planets and to talk about this and that, which is all fun and games until somebody comes with a well-meaning interest in learning about their soul. And they come to somebody who read a book. And can talk all about, you know, like, oh, the sun is in your, your son is in Gemini. So that must mean that you are a chatty, catty person, per, chatty, catty person who should be like a phone salesman, <laughs> you know, because the sun is in Gemini. 
And so this person's like, well, I had much deeper questions, but I guess I should go and learn to be a phone salesman because this newbie astrologer told me I should. This comes back to a conversation you and I were having the other day. I am, I'm not being ageist or racist here, Mm. but to me, you're not an astrologer unless you can do it without computers. Cool. I I did the first 20 20 years before the computer revolution. I did all my charts by hand, worked them out in my head and and I did it all by hand. And if you can't work out a chart from an ephemeris and a book of tables and you rely purely on software to just push buttons, then you're not a proper proper astrologer Mm. because you're taking the shortcut. And you're not seeing the trajectory of those patterns as we were talking about. You know, one of the, one of the things that I mentioned to you, and I'm going to say it now, because I think it's a relevant thing to say here. Uh, and I'm under this caveat and it's, I'm taking it, I'm taking it on the chin, Steve, because I, I understand that you're right. And I, I always invite you to give me wisdom that you think I don't have, because how else am I going to see it? Uh, what I'd like to say is, um, Uh, Yeah, somebody whose legs are perfectly fine, if they walk around on crutches, they're going to lose the ability to use their legs. And in the same way, astrologers these days have, there's your legs right out there, but people are choosing to use the crutch of software and technology. And also, there's the magic as well, Dustin, because... From an ephemeris, I can look at an ephemeris and go, oh, the moon's in, okay, so the moon's in Pisces right now. Oh, okay, so Pisces is rising on the horizon. I can see the moon coming up over there. So that's the ascendant over there. But wait a minute, if that's Pisces over there, then that means that Sagittarius must be on the midheaven to the south of me. And then you think, okay, so that's Sagittarius, that's Pisces. Okay, so wait a minute. Therefore, that's Mars. Oh, so that must be Saturn because it says so in the ephemeris. Hey, I can see the square between them. And you can see the angles in the sky. You can see the planets in the sky and the patterns they're making against the backdrop of the stars. And it becomes alive. Wow. You're in it. You are it. You're part of it, as opposed to just looking at it on a screen. Very and to do, to do that in the real world, to take people out into the open air and go, look, there's Saturn, there's Jupiter. It, on a rare occasion, there's Mercury. And it's it's revelatory. <sighs> that, that, that visceral in the room, in the moment experience is something that I get it. I totally get it. Like when I'm, I'm a musician, you know, and I like to go to concerts and, you know, I could stand in the middle of the auditorium with my eyes closed and I'm getting the data. Like I'm, I'm hearing what the guitarist is doing, what the bass player is doing, whatever. But if I open my eyes, I can see that the guitarist and the bass player are in an energetic movement between each other that's different from the data that I'm getting in my ears. Like there's a, a part of the experience of the data that I'm supposed to be receiving is what's happening visually. So that's kind of how I relate this in a way is that that visceral experience is its own very important thing. You know, I almost wanted to ask you, Steve, because you mentioned that the equinox, we're in the spring equinox right now. Uh, we've, ju- or we've just recently passed the spring equinox. Something I wanted to ask you is that in Vedic reckoning, there is a directionality of the signs. Aries is considered to be cosmic east in a certain way yeah uh is that something that you abide by like when you're thinking in a natural horoscope airy the zero degrees aries is always the very start of the horoscope Mm -hmm. and zero degrees aries is always the start of the natural first sign therefore the natural first house yeah that's zero degrees aries is always going to be the ascendant in a natural horoscope Right. But you know, only one in 360 people will have a natural horoscope. Yeah, so. of course. Right, right. So do you kind of often think about these two different doorways to, you know, there's the geocentric perspective of Earth and of the actual East from Earth's perspective versus like, you know, you could almost think that like, ah, oh, yes, geocentric East is in cosmic galactic west if let's say libra was rising on the horizon because the sun yeah and these are things that you there's, think there's a third way of doing it there's the natural way there's the geocentric way but there's also the heliocentric way hmm. 
where there is no ascendant and, and midheaven and no planets are retrograde because you've got the sun at the center of the horoscope instead of the earth. Oh, right. And that's really, really useful for forecasting non-human events such as wow, cool. weather, volcanoes, earthquakes. Wow. Totally. That's, that's amazing because the sun really is like a... Uh... It's kind of in Vedic. We consider it to be the actual physical bones of the person. God. It's, God. God. And it's got the sun and moon are the oldest known God and goddess. Certainly, certainly. So that heliocentric perspective is very interesting. You know, I almost think that those of us on earth are experiencing through our geocentric and therefore limited perception. About, what about, is 20, happening. about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, myself and, a, and another astrological contact, a colleague, we obtained the data from the American Bureau of Seismology, the ABS. We got the data of a thousand earthquakes of category five or more in the, in the previous four years. And we run horoscopes on our basic spectrum computers or Windows 3 computers at the Whoa, time. That's amazing. And, um, we found that by we had the exact moment to the second of the earthquake in the exact location. Whoa. So we found that we could find a correlation using a geocentric horoscope for about 18 to 19 percent of them. But when we put it into heliocentric, we were up in the early 70s. Whoa, that really t- you're just blowing my mind with this because that really says something about when people do transits. Uh, do you, so do you kind of, you know, you are a weaver of the full picture when you do your transit readings. So yeah. you must integrate all three of these perspectives at the same time when you, I, I try to as yeah. much as my little brain can contain it. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I guess sometimes if you're talking about the, the human level of things, you don't necessarily but, 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 need to go heliocentric. Uh, a, practice makes perfect, and B, one of the oldest dictums in astrology, still relevant to this day, and it's something that everyone should remember. The planets impel, they don't compel. Mm-hmm. It comes back to free will. You always have the choice to go against what the planets say. And, of course, uh-huh. you'll probably suffer. Right. But that is your choice. Yeah, 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 yeah. So even the things that happen to us when we're going through Saturn return and it looks like, you know, like my job fired me, like this is something that is definitely an external thing. It's really an internal clock that was ticking that made that external phenomenon happen, if I'm reading you correctly. Absolutely. And it's down to perception because you could spend the next six months bitching and whinging about, oh, they fired me. I must be useless. Oh, poor me. Or you could go, oh, right. That gives me more time to declutter my life, to reorganize my structures and to come back in a much more cleaner, simplified, strong Mm. way. Right, right. It's like the non-dual idea that the electromagnetic field that's outside of you is essentially a part of the consciousness that is experiencing it. It's above, so below. Yeah, love it, Steve. Love it, buddy. Very good. Very clear, man. Um, so I'm looking at I'm looking at our time here, and we're at yeah, twelve yeah, yeah. ten right now. Uh, yeah. So I'm thinking. Well, are you shooting for about twelve twenty five my time to be finishing? We're gonna have up? to go in the next two or three minutes, Dustin. Okay. All right, Steve. I'll tell you what. Yeah. I don't know about what you got you guys watching. I don't know how many are watching or if they're enjoying this, but I'm really enjoying this. And I think this is something we could do a, at a semi-regular basis in the future. You know, sounds great to me, Steve, because this is, I've been, in, I've been enjoying the heck out of this. And to be honest with you, like I prepared a bunch of questions and I got one out of like 10. So that's exactly how I wanted it to be, to be honest with you. I knew it'd be something like that. So I would love to do this again with you, Steve. I think we should do this sort of every couple of months. Sure. Maybe every that sounds- nine, 10 weeks, something like that. Five or six sure. times a year. Yeah, nine or 10 weeks, five, six times a year. So I'm going to say nine, 10 weeks-ish. Yeah, I've really enjoyed this. It's been fun. Me too. And I'm glad the technology is working out. I will say I didn't press record. I'm going to remember that next time. But I know I can download this video. It's on YouTube. YouTube. You got it. You got it, buddy. So we should be good there. Steve... Mr. Judd, I appreciate your time. I can't tell you enough, pal. For everybody watching, if you enjoyed this conversation, uh, you can find Steve Judd, as I said, on his website, www.stevejudd.co. 
contact him on there, talk to him about a reading and also check out his YouTube because everything that you've seen here, he does pretty much it as a mainstay of your practice on your YouTube astrology. Uh, I'm Dustin Cormier and I'm so glad to be hanging out with you, Steve, and with everybody else. Uh, I'm going to see if there's any questions that I can answer after the fact um, on, on the comments and stuff like that. But it's time for me to leave because I've got something else I've got to prepare for in about 15 minutes time. You're a busy guy, Steve. So, I appreciate your time so much, buddy. Thanks, Dustin. And thanks to the people out there for your feedback. I hope it's been fun and interesting. And I look forward to doing this again. And we got more, more to come, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Steve. And we'll Take see you care. again. Bye now. Bye.